So a few things about our night together. We'll be together about 75 minutes and we'll have a Dharma talk as well as some meditation and then uh, audience Q&A. So at any time during the evening, you can type a question into the chat of whatever platform you're watching from. And then Mangala will feed that to us and we'll, we'll um, get to as many questions as we can. Um, if you want to have more one-on-one -on -one actions with folks, don't forget to sign up for the fellowship monthly virtual meetups. Um, you can find those at ramdas.org slash fellowship. And um, as always, we offer these for free. And if you're willing to make a donation, that can always be helpful. You can text Satsang to 91999 um, and there'll be a link as well for donations uh, from wherever you're watching from. So with that, I invite you all to take a nice big deep breath and settle into the space you're in. And just recognize that we are coming into satsang, into community with folks from around the world through space and time, this web of hearts and souls that come together. So I invite you to take a nice big deep breath, feel that loving presence that is all of us and uh, send a little to Jamie as we welcome him in this virtual live stream. Welcome, Jamie. Hi there. Do we jump straight in? Jump straight in, it's all you. Jumping. Hey folks. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, um, it's funny to come and do a thing on the Ramdas um, clan because um, there's obviously nothing that I could really say this evening that you don't already know. And so like, I just thought I would share with you one particular model that has been working for us a lot um, in our lovely gatherings over here and our global community of uh, the insanely gifted. And um, so we've decided to call this evening's shindig uh, the power of yin. And that for me is, um, we don't always uh, manage to carry off being in a constant state of Ramdas's I am loving awareness paradigm. Um, it seems that we have to experience this reality through the filter of existing within an individuated ego. And while that is going on for much of the time, um, we do all these different gatherings and workshops and seminars and things like that to to try and teach our egos to behave more like souls in the in-between moments where we're not in that beautiful loving awareness as just a natural state. So um, I understand the limitation of speaking in the dualistic, what it's like being a person kind of paradigm, but that's the way, that's where we're gonna go from this evening, what it's like being a person. And one of the things I've noticed um, just to define what we mean when we say yin and yang. Um, the ancient Chinese Taoists, who I love so much, you know, like 2,000 years before Jesus, were already exploring incredibly advanced scientific and healing and energetic and poetic and lyrical things. And they broke down reality, the dualistic duality reality into yin and yang that all of us, boys and girls, have a yin and a yang side. And our culture very much favors the yang. The yang is the use of our will, the doing stuff, the deciding things, the imposing our reality on the world, penetrating existence to get stuff how we want it. And that is basically how we live and how we're taught in schools to solve the problem and get to the end and do the exam and go somewhere on purpose and be quite busy doing it, as RD would say. Um, but the other half of our nature kind of gets overlooked, and that's the yin side of our nature, which is receptive, where a great idea pops into our head, where we are impacted by life. We are moved uh, by things, and it's a much less controllable situation when you're coming from the yin place. We are being moved, and so you don't always get to control reality that way, so it's fallen out of favor quite understandably because the ego wants safety 
the ego wants to avoid all risk and loves control. So the ego likes yang very much um, and doesn't really like letting go into the yin quite as much, apart from in very um, select times. But what I've discovered as an artist, um, as a filmmaker, as a ascended master, as um, a being, is that actually most of the genius of my life that I experience happens when I allow myself to be yin and allow myself to be more of a passenger, allow myself to be moved and surrender into what's going on. What the Taoists would say, you know, like going with the flow, letting the water find its most natural pathway down the mountain and not pushing the river. And even though it is a bit counterintuitive in our natural control trip way of meeting life um, to let the yin do it and to let life move us, let us let us be done by life. Um, certainly as a musician, like when you write a song, when I write a song, I don't use my yang to write a song. I don't go, I will play G, now I will play C and like make a song that way. Or if I do, it probably won't be a very good song. When we, most of the creators and artists among you will know that when we make music or write a poem or do anything creative, it feels like it's coming through when we're in our flow state. It's more like we hear the song. You twiddle around on the guitar and go, da, 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 and then you hear a melody and you go, oh, that sounds good. And you write it down and take the money and the credit. But really, you heard it, you received it. We're kind of glorified secretaries for the muse in a way when we make music, we listen to it. And we're in a yin state when we're doing our great compositions. And that's when the great genius comes through. And that's why we always feel a tiny bit sheepish when people come up and go, oh my God, that song changed my life. Uh, you kind of know that you didn't really do it. You heard it and you transcribed it, but you didn't exactly generate it yourself with your yang. So um, it's actually the yin that produces all the great music and all the great art. Similarly, in um, another great example of the treasure of life coming through yin is uh, in parenting. Mm -hmm. You know, many of us grew up with yang parenting, like Ramdas says, you know, you go into somebody training, your parents and carers are somebody and they're going to make you somebody too. And they kind of like Jimi Hendrix says, you get fingerprints on your brain. Um, but now we have learned, I hope, that it's actually yin parenting that really gets the best out of the child. It's by listening, by being receptive, which is a yin quality, by being curious, which is a yin quality, by receiving the energy of the child and really listening closely you become the yin, you become the space around that child instead of the yang parenting, which is like, you know, put your shoes on, get a haircut, be an accountant and sort of doing the child. Now we're being yin parents with the space around the child so it can evolve into whatever is the most beautiful tomato plant it wants to be. And we're just listening receptively to the child. So yin is really going to get the most treasure out of our parenting. And um, another very important area of life in our lovemaking. Again, you know, if you're doing your lovemaking on purpose, you're doing, oh, I'll do a bit of this, do a bit of that. That usually works. Um, you're not really going to have such beautiful lovemaking. But if you're receptive, again, if you're in your yin and you're listening to who you're making love with and feeling everything coming off them and every sensation and every sensitivity, and you're really tuning into them in a curious receptive way you'll probably have the most beautiful love making available so again the yin is the one that delivers so much of the treasure of life um so that is for me the power of yin is allowing ourselves to be that receptive and i don't sort of share this in a kind of woo woo um way I actually think it is the most efficient way to live. And that's for me is the only real point of our self-help movement and the new age and all the sort of uh, rainbow books that we read is like, is to be efficient, really to be efficient so that we can get the most out of this brief time that I get to be Jamie and you get to be Jacqueline and wherever you are in the world, you get to be you for this blink of time. It is the most efficient because really the most enjoyable, fulfilling parts of life are when we are yin, like when we, when we laugh, we don't laugh on purpose. We don't laugh when we're yang, we're doing a laugh. No, we're yin when we laugh. We are just sort of going about our life and something occurs to us that funny or moves us and a laugh comes through us. So it's, it's kind of more accurate to say, I am laughed than mm -hmm. to say the active verb, I laugh, or I am smiled, because you don't really smile on purpose unless uh, you're fake and um, feeling 
maybe some sort of manipulative thing. So really, the yin is where we're laughing. The yin is where we're smiling. When we dance, a lot of people say, God, I couldn't live without my five rhythms or without my dancing once a week or however long. I couldn't live without my dancing. Well, that's because most that's such a yin thing. When you're dancing, you're yin. The beat is yang. The beat is doing the penetrate. The beat is moving everything. And you are being moved by the beat. For some people, that's the only time in their life where they relax all their busyness and allow themselves to be moved and be yin. So it's no wonder that for some people it's like, oh, God, thank God I couldn't, couldn't live without that. So, so much of the treasure, creativity, lovemaking, parenting, laughing, dancing, the flow of life is to be experienced when we allow ourselves to be moved and, and practice the qualities of yin, which are curiosity, surrender, um, welcomeness, listening, spaciousness, um, all those kinds of things where we let life live us and we become in the flow of the greater river of life. Um, so that's my basic overview. I'm kind of condensing it quite a lot because I know we don't have very, very long today. Normally I would talk your ears off for hours, but we don't have that luxury of my voice going on and on forever tonight. Um, but there are a couple of areas of life where we would do well to look a bit closer. Um, the two areas of life that we look at on, like, on my workshops and the different kinds of movies that I make and stuff um, are really the two areas where we experience life are the mind and the body. So I just want to talk for a couple of minutes about how the yin is so efficient when we are trying to not exactly get control over our mind and body, but we're trying to be in harmony and not governed by all the crazy characters in the head. The first thing is, let's say, starting with the mind. You know, some people call it the monkey mind in meditation. I've got a sort of, some people will take 25 years in a cave in the Himalayas you know, just to get any kind of sort of a grip on this incredibly seductive, compelling stream of thinking. And so I went in there and I discovered, wow, I don't just have one monkey mind. I've got a whole committee of monkeys that live up there. If I only had one monkey mind, I might stand some chance of, you know, getting a handle on it. But no, I've got millions of different voices that live up there and they don't all agree with each other. That's the other problem. They've all got huge agendas of things that must happen, things that mustn't happen, and they don't all agree. It's no wonder my spaceship is sort of lurching and cavorting all over the place. So I decided to kind of go in there and see who all these different voices are. And um, I'm going to share with you maybe the first 10 that I came, that I found. And if you if you have them too, um, you're not actually live with me now. I can't actually see you, but you could just do this if this is one of yours. If it's really a big one of yours, when I name it, you can throw both hands in the air and go, hallelujah, Jesus, and bear gospel witness to your neurosis um, or write them down, whatever is helpful for you. But the first one I found in there is I go and list all the different compelling voices because it is really a committee of different monkeys in there i've got i feel i've got like the cast of one flew over the cuckoo's nest living in my head um like a bus behind me of all these different characters trying to get my attention and when they get stimulated those voices it's like they put you and me the lovely wise kind adult that we usually are put us to sleep and they take over they get control of the mouth they get control of the wheel god help us they get control of the email um so it behefts us, it beholds us, it somethings us to know a bit more about the individual so that we can meet them differently. And, and the way that we do that is with our yin is by listening to them and being curious about them so that we can get to know them better and therefore they don't govern our lives so much. We can notice them and they don't slip in so insidiously like Ramdas says. He goes, you know, they slip in, they go, psst, think me, I'm real. <laughs> um, and they slip in. So like we need to stay really, really wide awake uh, not get spiritual narcolepsy every time one of them gets aroused. So the first one that I found when I went in there was um, the diehard pessimist. There's just a character in there who's just watched, just going to ready to paint like anything that's going to go is going to, this is going to go wrong, paint the worst case scenario that this is going to go and start controlling and strategizing in advance, you know, how, how to sort of control the situation. And it's just pessimistic and always just starts running scenarios of, of the worst case, catastrophizing what's going to happen. So that's one. It's like, for me, it's like one of my weird Jewish ancestors that lives in my attic, sort of like, um, some insurance agent with a ledger or something. So, yeah, that was the first one that I found was this like diehard pessimist. What was the second one? Oh, yeah, the second one was the insatiable to-do list addict. 
is that a familiar one for you? Yeah, first we've got to do this, then we've got to do that, then we've got to do this, then we've got to do that. Any one of you who has ancestry, which has refugee ancestry, will probably have this one, this constant feeling that maybe I've left the gas on, I need to leave it, I need to go through it all again. So there's the insatiable to-do list addict, constantly running it through again and again and again, list making. Um, the third one that I found up there was the vengeful murderer. Um, you know, it's amazing. Even us beautiful spiritual people, maybe because we're in such suppression and denial of our shadow, it doesn't take very much for us to suddenly become incredibly judgmental when someone's not doing their asanas properly or something, I don't know, or, or driving stupidly in front of us when, when we're in a hurry or whatever. It's amazing what comes up because of years and years of suppression. You know, we were told when we were little that our anger was naughty and it was it was shut down. You know, well, they put something in your mouth every time. Um, so years and years of gulping back that anger, it suppresses and it grows and grows and accumulates into what Eckhart Tolle would call the pain body, uh, this great big lump of unexpressed emotional constipation that lives inside us just waiting for an idiot to come past out totally overreact because you're not just feeling that idiot you're feeling all those idiots that you couldn't express about back to the beginning of your childhood so that vengeful murder often leaps out um in in curious ways and, and if we've become controlled enough to never let anybody see it and never speak an unkind word to anyone as i'm sure very many of you have because you're super advanced spiritual beings um often instead of it showing the outside it gets on the inside you know because you start actually talking to yourself in a shitty way, you know, and you're just like, oh, you haven't done any yoga this week, you know, or start, you know, being like cruel to yourself. Because um, the further you push the beach ball down under the surface, of course, the more violently it springs back up, which is why they say, beware the anger of the quiet man. So that's the vengeful murder. That was number three. Number four, who's never far behind, is the insatiable deviant sex maniac. Anyone have that? Anyone not have that one? Um, every five minutes or however long, um, the mind that is just constantly going to eroticism and um, a sort of a misplaced creativity that's, a, you know, never quite being satisfied. Uh, the insatiable um, deviant sex maniac. It's almost like because they're, all these characters are sort of all vying for attention, they just sort of need oxygen. I think someone wrote a great book called Feeding Meat to the Demons. I think that was a Tibetan Buddhist thing. Um, it's almost like we need to have a group therapy session every morning with these guys and just sit in a circle and go, hi, everyone, morning. Hi, murderer, who's on the list today? Oh, everyone, okay. Hi, sex mania, haven't seen you for five minutes. You know, just like kind of greet them all in the morning, see them all. So they get a little bit of juice. And then for the rest of the day, they're, they're a little bit calmer. Anyway, number five on the list I found was the naive child. Oh, the naive child. This time it's going to be different. Oh dear, what we have put that poor little character through in our lives has taken so many of the hits, so many of the pressures, so many of the dark nights of the soul that that poor little chap has been through. So that's the, the naive child. Oh, number six is my favourite one, is the innocent victim, the one that's always persecuted, unfairly criticised, not appreciated, unfairly judged, treated badly, disrespected, the innocent victim. There I was. There I was, just trying to help. That's what you get. And also, my innocent victim isn't just one character, because when somebody has wronged me, when somebody has, like, sort of criticised me or, or whatever, I have to defend myself. I have to stay. So I have to, I've got a whole gallery of listeners, almost like a courtroom scene that in my head that I present evidence to about how unfair this all is. And, what they, and they listen to me. They go, yeah, Jamie, that is absolutely outrageous. So, like, there's the innocent victim plus entourage is number six. Uh, number seven and number eight, I look at on our courses and stuff as two characters. Some people meld them together as one, but actually I look at them as two. Is, is number seven is the inner critic. Anyone know what I mean? Have trouble knowing what I mean when I say the inner critic? No? That undermining voice that's just constantly like sort of oh, you're so rubbish. Um, being mean to yourself, basically some internalized version of probably of one of your parents or carers from long ago, or all those teachers that made you feel like you were the problem and you were unworthy and we kind of just believed it because we were immature and now it's deeply internalized, the inner critic. And there's another one that's similar to the inner critic is the slave driver. It's like, come on, come on, you haven't done any yoga this week. Oh, come on. 
you're eating all the biscuits. Oh, what is the matter with you? And now you're looking around the kitchen for more biscuits. You know, just like constantly exasperated. And it's so weird. We use all this time doing these workshops and meditations and practice to raise our awareness. But if you're the kind of person that when you catch yourself failing, you're never really failing, but if you catch yourself not acting in alignment with your highest spiritual values and you you go, oh, do it again, you give yourself that little kind of electric shock of cattle prod of punishment. Anyone here do that? Oh, did it again. Oh. I mean, isn't that strange that we work so hard on our awareness and then when we've raised our awareness, we use it to self-harm. Got to stop doing that. And I know some of you are a little bit more spiritual and you don't do that. You're more like, oh, I'm so disappointed in myself. I really thought I was past this stuff. Now you're using your awareness to be passive aggressive towards yourself. <laughs> Got to stop doing that. Anyway, so that's number six. Number seven, number eight are the inner critic and the slave driver, the, the Tweedledum and Tweedledee of evil. Um, number nine, the strategizing control freak. We all know about that one, don't we? Just constantly running strategies and controls and manipulations. That's the one that when you're running 25 minutes late, you phone them up and you go, I'm about 15 minutes late. <laughs> that's not okay. Um, that's like to manipulate them into not leaving, basically. We sort of like slightly bullshit people. You know, all these different strategies we have. Man, if I say it like this, then they'll think like that. But if I say it like this, Anyway, the strategizing control freak is one definitely to keep an eye on. And number 10, I mean, there are so many more, but let's say number 10 is the, oh, there's the superior, then we'll do 11. There's number 10 is the superior, no better, no all, I know more than you do, superior one. And the great one about that one to play with, um, especially if you like a little bit of drama, is there's five actual gestures you can do to back up that energy you know because is there anything more delicious than an authentic eye roll when you see someone being a twat so like you know the eye roll and then you can mix the eye roll with the sigh you so you've got two of you <sighs> then the eye roll the sigh and the shake of the head so you, <sighs> the eye roll the sigh the shake of the head and the tut so you, and then you get the eye roll, the shake of the head, the tut, the sigh, and the shrug. We can do it all together now. I know you're not actually in the room with me, but I, we're going to all together do it just because we are all connected right now in this moment. There's thousands of people online sharing this moment with us. So let's just have a multi-thousand. Let's just judge all those people out there who aren't nearly as spiritual as us, who are living their mundane, unawakened lives. On three, we're going to do all five at the same time. You Oh, shit, I forgot to count. One, two, three, all together. And actually, someone recently gave me a sixth thing that you can add on the end, is that at the end of the sigh, you go, for fuck's sake. So you can move, you can you can do it any way you wish, combine them any way you want. And then number 11 is the martyr rescuer pleaser. And I'm sure there are many people listening today who know about that archetype being the martyr rescuer pleaser, the ultimate failure manipulation, that we think that by giving more and more and more and sacrificing more and more and more, that God will love us more and look after us and we'll, you know, people will notice and treat us well. Has that manipulation ever worked once? No. It's so stupid, that manipulation. One, it doesn't work. Two, it's incredibly unattractive. Uh, and three, nobody ever even agreed to that. No one ever even agreed that if you carry all the bags to the top of the head, don't worry, it's only three arrows, that they will suddenly like treat you better if you, you know, it's just the ultimate failure manipulation. So anyway, there's 11 characters already up there. So the yin is the way that they don't control our lives anymore. When we're yin, we're listening. So what we do in the school of the insanely gifted is we listen to them. And we ask them questions. We see how they're doing. Because even though they are all behaving in really dysfunctional ways, um, they are actually all signifying a legitimate need underneath. When one of those crashes in, it means that there is actually a legitimate need that needs to be met in a healthy way. And if we cannot get spiritual narcolepsy when they jump in, we can stay awake and stay loving and kind and say, hey, Thank you for trying to you know, save me because they all think they're helping all these characters. Thank you so much for trying to help me, but I'm going to lovingly relieve you of duty. Um, and um, then we can listen to them 
and ask them questions and then sit in space and you hear the most amazing answers come back. And instead of governing your lives, now you end up being the choice maker in your life and you can listen to their input, but they don't, your mind isn't constantly running your life. So that's one of the great turning points of my life is going yin and asking those characters questions and listening deeply to them and detecting their legitimate needs and meeting them in a healthy way. It's the yin that's going to save us from our minds in that way. The other whole half of it, we're not going to get a chance to do the meditation, are we, Jacqueline? It doesn't matter. I've talked all the way through. Um, but um, the other half is the body. And because of this constant suppression, because we were told we weren't allowed to be angry, we weren't allowed to cry, we weren't allowed to look vulnerable, we weren't allowed to express our anxiety, all these things that were shut down in our childhood and buried and edited away into the shadow, um, because of all that accumulation of all that suppressed emotion and suppressed expression, we all have like this huge pain body, this huge lump of unexpressed emotional poo that lives inside us. And it overreacts all the time. And it overreacts so quickly and so violently when someone gets in our way or someone behaves in a way that we don't feel is right or upsets us, that we again go straight to sleep. The lovely, wise, kind adult that we are falls asleep. Uh, and once again, one of those characters get control. And it compounds because we are born in a culture, a comfort addicted culture. We won't, we don't want to feel those feelings when they come up. It feels awful when the heart contracts or explodes in that volcano. It feels awful. We'll do anything but feel those feelings. Run straight to the fridge, run straight to the crack pipe, whatever is your um, way of numbing out Netflix, whatever it is, shopping. We don't want to feel that uncomfortable feeling. The thing is that that huge lump of constipated emotional shit, basically, that lives inside us. We live in a genius body, the most genius self-mending thing we know of in the universe. And what does this genius self-mending thing, when you scratch yourself, it mends it over. It's incredible. If you break a bone, it knits itself back together. Your body and mind, like Deepak Chopra says, is an exquisite pharmacy. It's constantly, as we sit here now together, scanning for bacteria and viruses and then making its own drugs. It's secreting things from places, mixing them together and administrating them to us in the perfect quantities day and night. It's incredible. So with all that intelligence, don't you think it knows that we've also got this huge lump of emotional unprocessed constipation? Of course it knows. And what does the body's life genius want to do with constipation, want to do with blockages? It wants to flush it out. It wants to shit it out. And how does the body's genius shit out every day, try and shit out some of that constipation? It does it through one of the seven spiritual anuses that some people call chakras. That is the emotional plumbing system of the body. That's why when somebody upsets you, you feel it here, you feel it there, you feel it here, you feel it on one of those points. Because basically, when someone upsets you, they've basically made you emotionally shit your pants in public. No wonder we don't like those people. But every single time you get upset, it is actually your body shitting out some accumulated emotion. Now, because our ego hates any discomfort, we immediately go, no, 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 I don't want to feel that. And we try and just get away from that feeling, get rid of it, take a pill, go to Facebook, go to the fridge, whatever, just not feel it. So the ego is trying to not feel it and avoid anybody that makes us feel it. While at the same time, life's genius, let's call it the soul because we're crazy, life's genius is looking to excrete all that stuff. It wants to shit it all out. So while the ego is trying to avoid those people, the soul is actually looking for idiots. It's looking for people to trigger us, to stir it up, so that if we're brave ninjas, which we're all choosing to be after this, uh, after this talk, we're willing to feel it. And how do we do it? Where are we again? It's the yin. The yin feels stuff. The yin is curious. The yin allows. It's sensitive. It goes... It listens to the feeling. It welcomes the feeling. That's what the yin does. It doesn't go yang and try and do anything with it. It surrenders. It melts into allowing the sensation that it feels. And that's all we have to do for the body's genius to shit out today's cup full of crap that it wants to get rid of. All we need to do is be present, the ultimate yin quality. Be present, listening, feeling, allowing. And then the body will do the rest. All it needs is our willingness to be a participant by feeling and being staying present. And that's a yin quality. So it's the yin that will help us with all the characters in the head and the thinking mind and all those different bodyguards that are trying to help us 
uh, they think, and all that constant stream of thinking, which is basically all those different characters scanning for trying to help us and protect us from all risk. Or the body and all those sensations that we get triggered into different times. Again, the yin, allowing ourselves to feel it. Then after a little moment, the body knows what to do. It recalibrates it. The body knows what to do. It's just like when you eat food. You don't get involved in the digestion. You don't go, carrots coming down. You know that when you when you eat the food, your body's going to deal with it. You know that when you want to walk somewhere, you only need to think, where am I going? And your legs will take you there. The body does all the stuff without us having to really get involved. We just need to stay present with it. So a little bit repetitive. I apologize. I'm trying to fit in a lot in a short amount of time. Have we got time for a very quick 10 minute? Do you reckon? All right. We're going to do a 10-ish, maybe 15 or so, you know, 10 minutes. Like We'll call this a meditation, a little journey. Um, let's just jump straight into it together. I'm going to do the quick version of this just to give an example on if you want to experience trying out the practical use of the power of yin. So um, just sit comfortably in full lotus with both ankles behind your neck. No, just in whatever way is comfortable. Just sit naturally um, and just close your eyes or open your eyes, whatever feels natural for you. First of all, let's just notice that we're breathing. Just coming back to the breath, noticing I'm breathing in, noticing I'm breathing out. (sighs) Not doing anything clever with the breath. Once again, breathing is a yin thing. You're being breathed all day long. You're not breathing on purpose. You're being breathed. It's a yin experience. All the treasure of life is in the yin when we allow it. So allow yourself to be breathed. (sighs) Let's feel what that feels like. You can always come back to the breath. Always brings us back to this loving awareness of this moment, whatever kind of a drama is going on. (sighs) As we out breath, softening a little bit more, just noticing we're breathing. Here we all are. And as we're breathing, We allow the corners of our lips to turn up at the sides and the muscles around our face and eyes to soften. Let the jaw soften and just allow the mouth to go into a slight smile shape, even if you have to slightly put it there like a goon. Just allow your smile to be there and just feel that natural kindness that lives inside you, which is who you really are. That natural kindness, that simplicity that you really are. That feeling of being you. Just tune in to that feeling of being yourself that you've always had since you were a little boy or a little girl, that same feeling of being you. And just allow that gentle smile to enter the breath. So now we're inhaling the kind smile and exhaling the kind smile, creating like a lovely, gentle, smiling tide in and out. And the central nervous system absolutely loves it. Every out breath, a little bit more relaxed. And as we smile with the smiling breath, we're going to allow it, as we do a little body scan, as we smile through our body, we're going to allow the smiling breath breath to show us any feelings that are being felt in the body. So we're going to just start at the top of the head and we're going to bring our breath up to the top of the head and just imagine you're breathing in and around your skull plates like a 3D breath, like a three-dimensional MRI radar through the body, lighting up any feelings or sensations and just noticing as we smile into the skull, anything that feels tight or blocked or numb or emotional or tender, just noticing how the skull's feeling, breathing in and around the skull and the brain and the temple. Noticing how the forehead is feeling, just breathing the smiling breath in and around. And it's like blowing on embers, the smiling breath. It lights up and shows us where any feelings are lurking. Breathing around the back of the skull, the forehead, the cheekbones, the eye sockets. Just noticing how they're all feeling, not doing anything with the information, not analyzing anything, just noticing how everything's feeling. Just doing a little scan down the body. The jaw, is that loose enough? On the back of the skull where it meets the spine, the top vertebrae. 
How are they feeling? Are they feeling loose? You can allow yourself to sway your head a bit if you want. And the next vertebrae down. Can you feel each one individually? Don't worry if you can't. Noticing the inside of the mouth and the gums and the chin. And your throat. How's your throat feeling? Just feeling the breath coming through it. And the vertebrae around the back are still there, down the collarbone and the shoulders. Just noticing any emotion or any stuckness or any numbness or anything at all. Just noticing, just noticing how it all feels with this lovely smiling 3D breath, this smiling radar going through the whole body, down the heart center. Any tenderness in the heart, just allow it to be there, just saying... Hello, old friend. Sometimes you can even breathe at the back of the heart, between the heart and the spine. How does it feel in there as we breathe into the back of the heart, between the heart and the spine? I always find a little bit of tenderness in there. Hello in there, just saying hi down your arms, down your boobs or your moobs if you're a man your upper ribs and the heart itself, this incredible pumping organ beating with its chambers and arteries and valves. Thank God for having such an amazing functioning heart. Everything's softening and the smiling, appreciating and the vertebrae in the, between the shoulder blades. Mm. Going a bit lower, the lower ribs. Beneath the heart on the right, we have the liver, that huge, incredible bit of hardware, detoxing everything all the time and regulating the other organs, saying hi to the liver, thanking the liver, down into the solar plexus and the lower vertebrae around the back, just noticing how everything feels, really just feeling receiving the feelings, doing nothing more than that, softening with every smiling breath, down into the tummy, the spleen on the left-hand side, the kidneys around the back at the bottom. Thank God for having working kidneys, detoxing all the liquids. Mm, down a bit further into the belly and all the giggly bits and jibbly bits and intestines and gallbladders and all the things that we don't really know what they do. And the bladder and the hip bones, these incredible multi-directional ball hips that we've got, genius. Smiling into the hips, do they feel open and relaxed? And the coccyx around the back. Just everything softening, noticing anything. It feels blocked or numb or open or closed or emotional or anything at all. And the genitals and your bum and your perineum and all those sensitive parts, the inner thighs. Sometimes there's emotion around the genitals and around the bum. It can be a very emotional area when we just say hi to it, let it be heard, let it be loved. all that worry, down the inner thighs, the outer thighs, and that long bone from the hips to the knee, the longest bone in the body, the femur, all the way down the legs to those wonderful knees. These, again, incredible knees, these multidirectional, shock-absorbing, phenomenal things, these knees loving up those beautiful knees even if you've got knobbly knees we're loving them too the front of the knees the sensitive kissy area around the back of the knees down the calves your beautiful calf muscles and the shin bone down down just noticing if there's any emotion or any feelings in the legs down all the way to the ankles again shock absorbing multi-directional functional stuff with tendons and ligaments and all kinds of wonderful structural design and the 497 bones of the feet all working together 
down into your lovely toes, the soles of your feet. So that was a lovely body scan. I'd like you now as we're doing that, just to keep breathing into the body as if you're breathing into just the whole body at once, as if your whole skin covering with all its pores is all breathing as one big thing. Your whole skin envelope from your crown to your toes is all breathing. I want you to just feel that breathing all at once as one great big body thing and feel the skeleton, the incredible scaffolding that runs through the middle of all of it. Just feel, tune into your skeleton now, this incredible scaffolding that makes the blood in the middle of all the bones is where the blood gets made. That's pretty weird. So just feeling that amazing machinery that's holding the whole thing together. I want you to imagine that it's all held together by a big bit of elastic, like one of those child's toys of the skeleton. And as we breathe in, every single bone of the skeleton very slightly parts and pressure gets released from between the bones. So as we breathe in, like opening a can of Coke, all the pressure from between the bones disappears. And as we exhale, ah, it all settles back together beautifully and perfectly aligned. I'm going to do that again as we breathe in all the bones of the skeleton very slightly part. And any tension between them blows away like grey, wispy smoke in the breeze. And as we exhale, ah, it all settles back together, perfectly aligned, better than an osteopath. And one last time we breathe in and just feel the whole thing separating and any tension in the vertebrae, in the skull plates, in the knees, in the lower back, all just relaxes and just dissipates. Ah. And it all on the out breath settles back together, beautifully aligned. We're just going to do one more level now just to celebrate the yin and the uses of the yin. We've been taking this radar through our body. We're going to just try something now which demonstrates how I think the yin is so useful. So just stay with me with this internal. You're very beautifully internal right now, just staying internal with the breath. I want you to think now, of something in the last few weeks or recent times that upset you. Don't choose a massive upset, not an eight or nine or a 10. Just choose a four or five or a six. Think of something recently that annoyed you or upset you, but not in an absolutely re-traumatizing major way, just a medium level upset. Just think, recall that thing that happened that upset you or triggered you. And as you do it, As you recall it, you will notice somewhere inside your body wakes up and starts having sensations because we're so sensitive and we're so internal in our yin listening now. Think about that thing that upset you, what happened, and then just notice where in your body wakes up and says hello. And you might want to lay your hand on that place in your body. So just notice when you think of that upsetting incident, again, not too big a deal, don't re-traumatize yourself, but when you think about that medium level upset, just putting your hand on the place where you feel it. And now we're going to allow the smiling breath to be localized just in that area. Instead of going through the whole body, we're bringing our smiling breath radar just to the area that has woken up when we think of that upsetting thing. And just allow the breath, the smiling radar to go back and forth highlighting the shape of this feeling. So you're really looking at it through the breath. As we smile and breathe, it makes it glow like embers. And I want you to just look at it. And just as you're breathing in and around it, I want you to look at it and ask yourself, where is it right now? Just check out where exactly it is. And how big is it, that feeling? And what color is it? As you look at it, if it had a color, what what color does it have? And don't worry if you can't see one. We're just seeing if the yin shows us anything just by being curious. What color is it if it had a color? And what texture is it? Is it gooey? Is it hard? Is it soft? Is it glassy? Is it pointy? What texture is it? Just noticing paying attention, being curious, welcoming. And what taste is it if it had a flavor? What does it taste like? And you may not get answers or senses for any or all of these, just giving it a chance to speak to us. 
as we listen to it with our yin sensitivity. Just keeping that smiling breath in and around that shape. We're going to ask those questions again. Now, in this moment, where is it? Might not be in the same place anymore. And how big is it now? Is it exactly the same size? Has it maybe shrunk a little bit? Is it spreading out? Staying with it, what color is it now? In this moment, not before. And what texture is it now as we check it out? Curiously, welcomingly, openly, spaciously. What would it taste like? What texture is it now? Is it smoky? Is it glassy? Is it sandy? Is it still? Is it vibrating or throbbing? Just really tuning into it like a wine taster. Really curious. We're just going to ask those questions one more time. Where is it now, this exact moment? Keeping the smiling breath in and around it. And what color is it now? Is it changing? Is it dissolving? What's it doing? What texture is it right now, this moment? I'm going to do one last thing. So staying internal, stay with that feeling, stay with the sensation, one last thing. We're going to imagine that that lump of feeling has a mouth and a personality and a voice. We're going to ask it five questions and just listen for answers. We're just going to ask that shape, that feeling, five different questions and just listen curiously for the answers to see if anything comes back. And if nothing comes back, that's absolutely fine. We're just going to give it an opening, give it a chance with our yin listening. We're going to ask the unpretentiously named five golden keys of alchemy. We're going to ask that, imagine it has a character, this feeling, this shape inside you. We're going to ask it these questions and just see if anything comes back. The first question we're going to ask it about the upsetting incident when we think about the upsetting thing that happened that we decided to play with for this little exercise, if that upsetting thing that happened was actually a training simulation, what Ramdas would say curriculum, if that upsetting incident was some sort of a training, some sort of a lesson, what was I trying to show myself? Just ask that and see if anything comes back. Don't have to solve it with our busy mind. Just asking the question and letting it hang. If that upsetting thing that happened was actually some sort of a training or a lesson, what was I trying to show myself? What was I trying to show myself with that event? And the second question we ask in the yin is, if that experience was actually some sort of a reminder for me to self-care, what might it be? What was the reminder in that experience for me to self-care? Was it a boundaries thing? Was it some sort of a way I wasn't fully looking after myself? How was that experience a reminder for me to self-care? in some way that I've forgotten to. How is it a reminder to self-care? And the third question we ask, slightly hurrying, but that's okay. The third question we ask is, how is what happened an invitation for me to show up more, be more honest, be more verbal, be more visible, maybe more, more vulnerable? How is what happened an invitation for me to show up more and be more honest and speak my truth, say something unsaid? 
How is it an invitation for me to show up more? Thank you. And the fourth question we ask is, how did it hurt more because of my painful past? How did what happened actually hurt more because of my painful past? Because of my history. And last of all, we ask, through all of this, what are the gifts I can share with others? Through all of this, what are the gifts I can share with others? Just listen if there's any answer coming back from that. And the lovely yin listening. Just rubbing that place on your body, wherever it is, and just saying thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for feeling your feelings, not abandoning yourself, but really showing up for your feelings and let that place in your body know, I'm not going to abandon you. Your feelings are worth feeling. Whenever you want to feel your feelings, I'm going to be right here feeling them with you. Your feelings are welcome. There's nowhere I would rather be right now than with you feeling these feelings. Thanking that little character, letting it know it's welcome letting it know it can come home in any way that feels natural. Ah, and over the next few breaths, thanking and rubbing that character home, over the next few breaths, gently coming back into the space. Just give ourselves three breaths to come back in. Ah. And one more for Ramdas. Ah. Thanks, everyone. Sorry that journey was a little bit rushed. But there's a little example of how the yin can be so revealing and such an ally when we're so busy in our yang most of the time. Thank you for indulging me. Jacqueline, I could see it was running on a bit there. That was Fabulous. That was such a lovely meditation. Um, it's going to take me a second to actually come all the way back and be with you. But um, yeah, what, what a gift for all of us, for sure. Um, so much of that was such a gift. Um, one of the questions that was coming up really early on was sort of around the this idea of yin. And is it softness? Is it feminine? Is it um, can you have too much of it? Um, how do you balance it with, you know, how do you know when, how to balance it with young? Can you speak into that a little bit more? Well, I would say that if it's out of balance, like it is for most people, like the yang is too dominant and we need to, it's not to get rid of yang or make yang wrong, but we need to like bring more yin into our lives. Um, when it's out of balance, usually the events of our lives show us so. So if you're too yin, then you'll suddenly find you're not getting anything done. You're feeling a bit lollopy and depressed and you can't quite get shit going. And, or maybe you're someone that doesn't allow yourself to rest and be in yin. It could be that as well. So don't imagine just because you're procrastinating that it means you're too yin. But um, generally, the events of our lives will show us and mirror to us what the imbalance is. Um, and it doesn't mean that we need to jump straight in in a very busy, oh, I need to bring in more of that or oh, I need to do less of this. It's more just like a real listening to what feels comfortable. Usually when we're out of balance and there's too much of this or not enough of that, it feels uncomfortable. We feel too sluggish or we feel too hyper or we feel too stressed or we feel too controlling. And and I guess a really great way, if you, if you have trusted satsang um, around you, it's a vulnerable but beautiful thing to do to actually just ask the people close to you. Just say, you know, if you're if you're in any doubt about it, just say, what do you think? Do you think I'm sort of, you know, too busy, busy, or do you think I'm too kind of like serene and in the sort of utopian tantric bliss, but not actually living a human life, not engaging? 
you know, it's really sexy to to ask the people close to you what they think, and it's vulnerable, uh, but it's also very intimate and beautiful. Mm-hmm, absolutely. That's a sweet space and somewhat terrifying sometimes as well, those intimate, vulnerable places. Um, someone asks about the difference between yang and free will. Well, people have people's jury is out about free will. I know when Ramdas turned up in his bus after the Kumbh Mela and there was already food and lodging ready for everyone on the bus, had to make him question free will, you know. Uh, so, yeah, my jury is out about free will. But Yang, you know, in my experience of being in an ego and having choices and doing things, Yang is the use of free will. It's the use of choice, how we penetrate the world with our will and make it how we want it is kind of a, is a good description of, of, of being yang. Mm-hmm. And some people say yang is masculine and yin is feminine, but in these days of gender issues and non-binary and, you know, when we say feminine and masculine, we're not talking about boys and girls. We're talking about plug sockets and electricity, you know, the outward moving force or the receptive force. So, yeah, we've kind of removed the masculine feminine labels from yin and yang recently because, um, it, it causes more confusion than help. Yeah, the, I think one of the ways that's helpful for me was recognizing like the origin of the word yin was like north side of the mountain, yin yang was the south side, the south side being where the like the sunny side and the yin being the dark and what happens. And those two places are very different. Oh, and that's helping mm, cool. it a little bit. Um, one of the things you talked about was uh, being present with our feelings, which is really something we're not taught often in this culture um, and that there's this real magic in being present with our feelings. Um, But it also brought up this idea that um, that when our feelings can become overwhelming, whether it's trauma or um, just a backlog, that it feels like it will never end. Um, Mm. and, And that we can get sort of consumed by it at times. And just this idea of um, maybe like titration or keeping the foot in the light or I don't know, do you want to speak to, to that phenomenon? It's an irony, it's kind of a paradox there because usually the times when those feelings become overwhelming is because we've been not feeling them. <laughs> so there may be in the initial stages a little feeling of overwhelm, but that's usually in my experience resistance. It's like, I don't want to feel it. So it builds up pressure, pressure and goes into overwhelm. But usually when we soften and go and take away the labels of the feeling, then they're much easier to feel. Like if I'm, I sometimes I'm driving along, this is a technique that's helped me. Often I'm driving along and suddenly I just get whacked by this absolute tidal wave of hopelessness and despair. (laughs) Do you ever get that? You're just like driving along and suddenly everything is wrong. You know, like nothing's okay. And so I would say, God, I'm feeling some huge waves of grief, you know, Now, the problem with that is grief is such a loaded word. It's got all the connotations of grief, all the grief we've seen in movies, the grief associated with death. You know, it's like grief, grief, grief. And it's much harder to to feel it when I call it grief. So what I do is I, I stop calling it grief. I take off that label and I call it a word that has no meaning. I say, I call it schlumpf or wugahumpftemuff. I'm feeling wugahumftemuff. Now, because I don't have any connotations with the word wugahumftemuff, I'm only having that experience in the now. I'm not having all the different weighted loadedness of all the other old feelings that I associated with this feeling that I didn't want then and I don't want now. When we give it a word that doesn't mean anything, I'm feeling wugahumftemuff, suddenly you're really only in this moment of feeling, which is is usually quite handleable. Um, And the thing about that is that usually when we're feeling, we've been so culturally addicted to comfort that we think whenever we feel anything that's not nice, it's wrong. I don't want it. We go into massive resistance. So then we've got two problems because life is going to have pain in it no matter what. So usually we feel pain and then we feel, oh, no, I don't want this. How can I get rid of it? So now you've got two problems. You've got the pain plus the resistance to the pain. Now that equals suffering. Yeah. But when you have that first pain and you instead of going, no, 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 you go, yes, 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 like we just did in that meditation and you meet it with curiosity, then the body can recalibrate it and it turns into liberation. So it's like pain plus resistance equals suffering. Pain plus curiosity equals freedom. 
Mm-hmm. And so it, it's, it's, can you meet it without resistance? Can you go, yeah, you know, that become a wine taster of it. And when, when we take away the idea that I don't want this, mm. suddenly it's all, oh, it's caramelly or it's pointy or it's this, it comes, you suddenly like, you should try it with a headache. If any of you ever get like headaches or yeah, it's really interesting, instead of taking a painkiller for your headache to actually really welcome the headache and go really into what shape it is, what color it is, what, you can have a really mystical experience through a headache by practicing letting go of resistance and giving it full, full welcome with low level pain or period pains or, you know, certain things which are sort of like medium level, if they're not absolutely drastic, obviously if if it's full on traumatic, then you might need a painkiller. But with things that, you know, you test your ability to go into pain and actually not look at it as a negative, but look at it as a fascination. Yeah. Yeah, there's um, a couple of things that came up when you said that. Um, and one was this idea of um, the resistant office often being like, if I'm in pain, I'm doing something wrong. So I have to fix it somehow. I think that we often meet it with that. God, we think that, yeah, it's God's scorecard. I yeah, mean, like we're being punished. punishing God. Mm-hmm, exactly. And then the other is um, that pain piece, you mentioned period pain of like that can actually be this shamanic journey in some ways, if you just sort of ra- go with it and let it be. Mm. Um, I think it could be a portal for sure into various other states. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you've got to suit up and you're not being a good enough spiritual warrior if you don't do it. If you do this stuff once in 10, you're the Buddha. Well done. Right. <laughs> well said. Um, this is someone from the audience is referring back to uh, becoming nobody. And they w- are curious about how you prepared for the interview with Ram Dass. Um, it just seemed to this person, it says it s- seemed like you're speaking from a h- higher place, uh, even when you're talking about all the neuroses. Yeah, forgive me. This I don't mean to sound arrogant when I say this. It does annoy people. I am very, I'm, I'm not big on preparation. I'm kind of like, I assume that the natural flow of things will happen when I show up, if I am open and and loving. Um, That has mostly been okay for me. Of course, there have been times in my life where it's gone terribly wrong. I turned up to interview Dennis Hopper once, and I thought I was coming to interview Dennis Potter, who's a dead English playwright. I don't know what I thought I was doing. Um, But I just love Ramda so much. You know, I absolutely love him like family, like my favorite, you know, just... I adore him and what he's given me. So just, I just, my preparation was just to go and and ask all the questions that I'd always wondered, you know, listening to his tapes, his audios, you know, I've always wondered certain things like why people are so busy saying that this life is all an illusion and that kind of spiritual bypassing trip and, and all the different things I asked him were just stuff I've always wanted to ask him, you know, and I had the great luxury of actually being in the position where I could say, Hey, what about this? You know, like, why did, why did Maharaji say, give up your anger, not work on your anger? What was all that about? You know, like the things I was still curious about Mm -hmm. and also personal things, you know, like, yeah, I, I really just love him so much that it was just very natural to have a conversation with him. And, and, um, um, so yeah, I didn't do an awful lot of preparation except that I had already chosen certain parts of the film of of his talking and his beautiful expressions. And so sometimes when there's all, I already knew he was going to talk about anger or he was going to talk about certain things in the film, I would want him to talk a bit more about those so that it would all fit together seamlessly. Mm-hmm. But really, I was just in the lovely luxury of being in his presence and having a really good laugh with him, you know. Mm-hmm. I came through. I love, I love laughing with him. You know, I just love yeah. laughing with him so much. I love his laughter. That's why I made the film because I love his other films. You know, I love Fierce Grace. I love all of them, but they're not funny, the other ones. And, you know, he's a great sacred clown. He's the ultimate sacred fool. You know, he's, he's, he opens the heart through all that laughter and, and silliness. And so the spirit of the teachings goes straight into the heart because he's opened them up through laughter and foolishness. And it doesn't really come across in the other films. So I just really wanted to, that was my main excitement for making this film was to make this bottle of Ramdas medicine that lasts forever, that for as long as we can play movies for centuries, if the human race lasts, people can always get the Ramdas hit, you know? 
another amazing gift. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and one last question before we wrap up, um, unless there's some other things that come up, but back to the topic of yin, someone asks about uh, being in this culture that is so incredibly young um, and, and just sort of navigating being a more yin being um, in that, that culture. Yeah. Um, wherever possible, slow down. Mm -hmm. And that may not mean that you can definitely slow down at work. Maybe your boss wants you to work at a certain speed and maybe that's not the right job for you, not for me to say. But certainly there are areas if you want to bring more yin, you know, like one thing I recommend to a lot of my people that I work with one-on-one -on -one, um, is I get people to do all their washing ablutions at half speed because often we're in and out of the shower quick wash 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 you know we kind of we we fly through moisturizing you know really moisturize or oil whatever you put on your skin do it like you're doing it to the most precious baby you know rub your chest do it slowly wash yourself slowly carefully like you're washing jesus or something you know like really you can there are a lot of areas where you can really really slow down um so start with those, you know, and stop for 30 seconds. You know, I'm a really big believer in 30 second meditations. I'm not that guy that every morning is going to sit on a cushion and light the candles and do the whole thing, you know, like, um, but I'd stop at different times in the day just for 30 or 60 seconds and be totally, totally present. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I say to people, it's quite useful if every time you use a key, every time you use steps or stairs, or every time you use water, like a tap, a faucet, if any of those three times, anytime you use one of those, you stop for 30 seconds mm. and then carry on with your day. But it's a really, really great presence practice just to keep injecting little moments of yin among the yang. Mm, I love that. I love that. Um, well, it's been such an incredible joy to get to spend this time with you and to hear your wisdom and your joy. Um, and I just want to give a big thanks to all the folks on the back end as well, Mangala and JR, who you all don't see, who really do a lot to make this happen. Um, and just a big thank you to all of you for being here this evening and for tuning in and for being a part of this community. Um, just so you know that you can rewatch this live stream at any time and share with your friends, go to ramdas.org slash live stream dash replay. Um, also, if you want more one-on-one -on -one connection with folks within the satsang, uh, make sure you sign up for the fellowship. It's ramdas.org slash fellowship. This way you can join our, our one of our many monthly um, meetup groups. Uh, we have a book club starting Wednesday on being Ramdas. So hopefully y'all sign up for that. Mm -hmm. right. and, yeah. And lastly, uh, we do all of this for free. So if you're able to donate, it's super helpful. You can text SATSANG, S-A-T-S-A-N-G, to 91999, and there'll be a link as well. Do you have some things coming up you want to share with folks? Me? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, there's always, we do a lovely gathering twice a week, which is free, which is um, 2 p.m. New York time every Wednesday. And the Saturday one, you'll all be in bed. It's 11 a.m. UK time. But but 7 p.m. UK, 2 p.m. New York time. So I guess that's 11 a.m. LA time. Um, every Wednesday is the lovely gathering on my Zoom and we just come and just be together and read poems or sing songs or chat about what's going on. Um, I've got a retreat coming up in Corfu, um, which is free also at the end of August called Shadows in the Sun. Um but nearly every Saturday, there's some sort of a kind of workshop, insanely gifted or um, uh, transforming shadows or project building masterclass, you know, just come to my website. Just no one's ever turned away for money reasons. There are ticket prices, but if you can't pay it, nobody minds. <laughs> we prefer people buy a ticket, but if you can't, no, we wouldn't dream of anyone not coming if they didn't have the money. So it's a hundred percent inclusive business. And I guess the last thing I want to say, apart from thank you so much for including me, um, is uh, just really look out for your self-talk. You know, if you want to do just one thing, just really look out for 
treating yourself in an exasperated way or a critical way, just really watch out for that. Just always rubbing the chest and making the sacred mantra noise. Whenever you find yourself failing, just every one of your so-called failures, you need to find more adorable than the last. Then you really know you're on the right track. Every time you think you're not doing it right, or why aren't I more like this? Or, oh, why did I do that? Tutting at yourself, whatever. You've got to start finding it more adorable than the last every single time. So the greatest spiritual thing you can ever do is you rub your heart like this and you make the sound. You can make the sound with me now. It's a very ancient, sacred sound. Just make the sound with me, all of us together now to end the session. You rub your heart and you go like this. This very Do it with me now. You make the sound. It goes like this. It goes. Oh, oh, you're lovely, you are. Oh. And if you're not treating yourself like that, don't bother doing any yoga or meditation mm -hmm. because you're starting off from the wrong point. He didn't just say awareness, our oh, beautiful Ramdas. He said loving awareness. If you're not treating yourself in a loving way, it means you're asleep. It's a blanket rule. If you're not treating yourself in a loving way, you're asleep. So that just, oh, lovely you are. Always start from that point and notice the self-talk that deviates from that. If you only Thank you. So, so much for having me. It's such